Alrighty guys, welcome back to the shop. In today's video, we will be completely restoring a DIY hydraulic forging press that I built in 2006. Since we will be replacing just about every piece on this machine, this will be a very good guide for those of you who are looking to build your own press. If you fall into this category, check out the description below for a parts list for all the pieces I used during this build, as well as a PDF download with a full set of dimensioned plans for this press. If you end up finding this video helpful, make sure to hit the like button down below and consider subscribing to the channel because it really helps us out. With that, let's get to the narration. As y'all can see, this press has a mad wobble to it and it's really not safe in its current condition. It has eighth of an inch angle iron as the feet and back in the day when I used it, I had it bolted down to the floor. So it wasn't too bad in use, but as a freestanding press, I feel like it's pretty dangerous in this configuration. So we're going to make some beefy feet out of 2x2 two two square tubing with a 3x2 two square tubing upright, all 1 8 of an inch thick. You can see here that I'm extending a piece a little bit longer because I didn't have the appropriate lengths. And with steel prices the way they are right now, I'm trying to get by with using as much scrap steel as possible. This is the first major project that I used the Evolution Cold Cut Chop Saw on. And I found that the clean cuts and the square cuts really sped up the process. I'll be putting these quarter inch angle iron tabs on the end of the feet with holes in them so that if I ever do want to bolt this press down to the slab, I have easy mounting holes on the feet already there. I know I've mentioned this in some of my previous videos. However, I think it's worth mentioning again that this clutch welding table in combination with the squares from Fireball Tool are really a game changer when it comes to doing welding projects. Setting all this stuff up was much faster and being able to work off the ground is just more comfortable in general. You can see here that I'm finally getting my welding machine dialed in. And I think this weld I'm about to show you is probably the best weld I've ever done with this MIG welder. So I was pretty proud of that guy and that's why I zoomed in here for you guys. I ended up putting a quarter inch cap on the top of these feet sections on the top of the two by three portion at least of the feet sections. And I did that more so out of aesthetics than anything else. I'll be putting some angled supports here. They're at a 45 degree angle, just with some scrap steel that I had laying around. And that's pretty much the entire construction of the foot. So I have two of these feet and I'll put them on each side of the hydraulic press. But before that, we're gonna go ahead and start tearing down the press, getting it a little lighter so that we can shorten it before putting these feet on there. As I mentioned in the intro, we will be replacing just about every component on this press, including the hydraulic hoses, as well as the cylinder itself. One of the major reasons why I decided to replace the cylinder is because this five inch cylinder was rated for 1500 PSI, while my pump can put out 26 to 2700 PSI. And I felt like this spec brake was a little bit unsafe and I didn't want to ever have the ability to overpressure this cylinder. As you can see, my traveling block here was stuck in there pretty good. I think it was a combination of paint and rust just sitting there for years. So I ended up having to hammer this guy out and I eventually got it free. I used some WD-40 as well to kind of ease it out of there. To get the cylinder out, this guy is kind of heavy. So I took some two by fours and clamped them to the frame just so that when I drive this pin out, the two by fours will support the weight of the cylinder and it won't just come falling out of there. It may be kind of hard to tell with the sped up footage here, but a lot of these hoses are custom length hoses with custom fittings. And when I originally made this press, I kind of just showed up at a hydraulic shop and said, hey, can you hook this thing up for me? And they made a bunch of custom hoses. So with this build, what I want to do is replace all those hoses with standardized hoses so that I can easily replace them in the future. So that means I'm going to need a whole new set of fittings as well so that an off the shelf hose can just plug and play into this press. So what you can see me doing here is just attaching this thing to the wall so that it doesn't come slamming down on me when I take these feet off. It was just kind of a precautionary thing. I think it actually would have stayed standing on its own with this four x four square tubing. However, I didn't want to take any chances here. So I took off the old set of feet and this is pretty much just a big chunk of scrap steel at this point. With the original build, I found this press to be just a little bit too tall, or at least the working surface was a little too tall. I found that it caused me to shrug my shoulders up when working in the press, and it was just uncomfortable in general. 
So to remedy this, I will be cutting off a little bit of each foot with the cold cut chop saw. It's really putting this chop saw to the test. I mean, four by four quarter inch square tubing is no joke. So I shimmy this guy under there and cut about nine inches off of each foot. Now, like I mentioned in the intro, I'll be putting a full set of plans for this press so you can get an idea of the dimensions that I used for this press build. And I think that should be a good starting point if you're looking to build your own hydraulic press. One thing that you can see me doing here is that I'm standing the press up on top of two pieces of steel plate. And the idea here is so that when I weld the feet on, the 4x4 square tubing is not touching the ground, causing a teeter-totter with the hydraulic press feet. So I have it elevated a little bit. I put each foot on both sides of the press and weld them on. Once I have the feet welded on, this guy is way more stable. Now, you know, my concrete floor is not perfectly level, so there is going to be some wobble depending on where I put it in the shop, but it is very solid at this point, especially compared to what it was. I think wherever I decide to put this guy in my shop, I'll probably cut a piece of three quarters of an inch horse stall mat to put under it just to kind of level out the concrete floor and make sure that there's no wobble in this guy. So here I'm welding in a little frame at the bottom there. You can see that it doesn't need to be that substantial since it's only holding the hydraulic reservoir. So I just used some eighth of an inch angle iron and a piece of half inch plywood. I'm going to end up buying a new reservoir for this guy just because that old reservoir probably has a bunch of moisture in it. It could have some rust in it potentially and I just didn't want to deal with any of that. In addition, the older reservoir was a five gallon reservoir and with the gallons per minute output of my pump, I thought that a 10 gallon reservoir was more appropriate for this press. So what you see me building here is a shelf. This shelf will be welded onto the back of the press and used to hold the motor and the pump on the back of the press. Now, as you can see, this motor has been sitting out in the weather for a long time now, but it does still work. It is a three horsepower, 3,450 RPM motor. And it seems like a lot of the pumps, the hydraulic pumps, have a power requirement of around five horsepower. But I think that could be with a gas powered engine opposed to an electric engine. I'm not sure if it makes a difference, but I kind of suspect that it does because this three horsepower motor seems to do just a fine job with this pump. So what you guys just saw was a very crude mount that I made back in the day out of a piece of four by four by quarter inch square tubing cut at an angle with a torch. I decided to make a more professional bracket for this build a because I think it looks better and B because I wanted the shaft of the pump to match up with the shaft of the motor without having to use a bunch of shims. So I drew this guy up in Fusion 360 and then printed out a template with a one to one ratio so that I can lay it down on the piece of steel and center punch where my holes will be. I'll be drilling a 48 millimeter hole in the center of this mounting bracket as well as four mounting holes for the 11 gallon per minute pump that I used in the original build. Looking on Northern site, it looks like this same pump is being sold today. So if you're looking for an 11 gallon per minute pump, you can check that out. And I'm sure the dimensions of this mounting bracket would also work for that pump. While I was attempting to drill this large hole in the center of this piece of plate with my mini mill, I ended up bogging it down a few times. And in order to prevent the chance of me damaging my mini mill with this operation, I decided to finish the hole with a hand drill and I was able to be a little more violent with the hand drill and not really uh, worry about breaking anything. So that's why you saw me transition to the hand drill there. So I get everything uh, mocked up here on the welding table using the fireball square, made this really easy. I just uh, made it sure we were at a nine degree angle and tacked this whole thing together. And here you can kind of see the old and the new side by side. I think that the new one is a little bit more refined than the, <laughs> the old mount that we had there. So it got the job done back in the day, but it was time for a change. These are the Lovejoy couplings that go in between the motor and the pump. I'm going to use the same Lovejoy couplings, but I want to just clean them up a little bit as you saw me doing there with some sandpaper and a wire brush. So I put a little 20 weight oil on here just to make sure everything's nice and lubricated slide the couplings on, and then I make sure to install the rubber spider in between the couplings. I ordered a new spider so that I'm using a new piece of rubber there. 
I'll then mark out where I need my holes in the shelf and I drill through the base plate as a drill guide. So the only thing left to do with the bracket obviously is to get it painted up because we don't want any rust on this guy. So as I mentioned earlier, we are upgrading this hydraulic press with a bunch of new components. And one of those new components is a new five inch hydraulic cylinder that's capable of 3000 PSI. These larger cylinders use inch and a quarter pins and my old cylinder used one inch pins. So the H-frame holes need to be enlarged to accept the larger pins. So this is a fairly daunting task and my first attempt was to drill and tap the center of a one inch pin and use that one inch pin as a pilot for my hole saw. I found that this did not work particularly well and the one inch pin kept falling out of the center of the hole saw, I think due to the friction of it brushing up against the existing one inch hole. And the speed of my drill press was just a little too fast for drilling a hole this large through a piece of one inch plate. What I ended up doing was cutting a slug off of that one inch pin and welding it into the one inch hole that I am going to be enlarging. By doing this, it put a quarter inch hole in the center of the existing one inch hole, which is the appropriate size for the pilot of this beefier carbide tipped hole saw. I then use my mini mill at a low RPM to cut these holes. It took about one hour per hole to get drilled all the way through this piece of one inch plate. I did end up bogging down my mini mill a couple times here and found that the best way to drill these large holes was to advance it slowly and repeatedly pull the bit up to remove the chips. So I would advance it a little bit, then pull it up, remove the chips, spray some more cutting fluid in there, and then just repeat that process until the hole was drilled. So that's why they took so long to drill. The harder hole than the traveling block here was obviously drilling it on the frame itself. This frame is large and bulky, and I ended up wanting to get the mini mill on the floor to drill the hole in the H frame as well. So getting everything set up took a while. I'll be using the same method. I'll put the plug in the H frame plate, weld it in, and that center hole will be my pilot. So now that we have the center hole pilot welded in there, the next step is to take apart the mini mill, take it off of its current workbench, and move it onto the floor next to the H-frame. Before doing that, I need to level the H-frame and then measure how large of a stand we need to hold the mini mill at the appropriate height. I'm just using some pieces of two x four here, cut to the appropriate length in order to hold the mini mill at the appropriate height for the hole to be straight when it's drilled through the H press. So this took a little bit of measurements and going back and forth to make sure I got all the measurements right. But I got the mini mill here on the stand. I'll then hold up the H frame and put some supports under it and slide the mini mill in between the two pillars and then carefully bring the H frame down around the mini mill. I was a little nervous here because the last thing I wanna do is damage this piece of equipment but I took my time and nothing got damaged. Same deal here, we just went in and out and added a ton of cutting fluid until we had this hole drilled all the way through the one inch plate. So after everything was said and done, we had an enlarged hole in both the traveling block and in the H frame without too much pain. I took this opportunity to go ahead and bring the H frame outside and put a very light coat of paint along the top of the H frame because this is kind of a hard spot to get to and I felt like this was a good time to do it. As you can see on the top right side of your screen here, the traveling block guides actually contacted the tie rod cylinder when the cylinder was in its closed position. And in order to prevent this from happening, I decided to take out a significant amount of steel on the top of these guides. To do that, I just used my bandsaw to cut the bulk of it out along with the angle grinder and then I used an eight inch contact wheel to clean everything up. So I'm actually gonna use the steel that I took out of this traveling block guide in order to make the die holders, uh, which is the next part of the process here. So you can see that the die holders I originally used were pretty uh, weak and pretty crude actually, and they didn't look very good. They were just some pieces of eighth inch angle iron cut to the appropriate height to hold the dies. I didn't like the way they looked and I thought they were pretty weak. So we're gonna take some half inch plate here and make some new die holders. Not only will they look better, they'll be stronger, 
and they're also going to be significantly wider than my original die plates. So I wanted to have the extra width there for uh, whatever type of dies I plan on making in the future. So I took these pieces of half inch plate and I welded them about seven inches apart from each other. And then I took a piece of quarter inch plate and welded it on top so that it will hold the die in. I then put a backstop on these die holders with a piece of quarter inch plate there. And I ended up moving that later on in the build and you'll see it. Uh, just one plate in the middle there kind of caused a little bit of a pivot point for the dies and it didn't uh, get held in there as squarely as I'd like. So here's me doing the same thing on the H frame. And this was a little tighter to get to and I ended up using a fireball minion square and some one, two, three blocks to get the spacing right to hold those pieces apart from each other. After that, I threw some paint on these guys just to stop anything from rusting and also because I felt like this was a good time to do it. I cleaned up the traveling block and painted it as well. Now I thought about rebuilding that traveling block, but I, I didn't really see the need. It seemed like it was doing a perfectly fine job. So maybe down the road, if I ever needed to, I could rebuild one of those. So these are the old dies and I'm just kind of taking them apart here because I wanted the steel. You know, they're the pieces of one inch plate and some half inch plate. And you know how that stuff's hard to come by nowadays. So what you see me doing here is extending the five inch dies, the seven inch dies using some of that scrap plate and I'm making a new set of flat dies using the old uh, plate that I had. So these are pretty simple dies. I just have a seven inch base plate and the total height of each of these dies is about two inches. That works out to the dimensions that I need for my eight inch stroke cylinder uh, so that these two dies meet up just about perfectly with that eight inches. So here I'm grinding off the old tab like I mentioned earlier and I'm going to be putting two tabs uh, in its place. So I'm going to put them um, kind of equally spaced in between this seven inch die. This ended up working way better. And when you put the dies into these die holders, uh, you just don't get any wiggle like you did when you had just one center point there. So it's a much more secure die hold. Now, later on in the build, I'll be adding some front holders. I kind of do that last. Uh, so if you're wondering why there aren't any front tabs here to hold the dies in, uh, that's why I kind of do that at the end. So here I'm making a set of combo dies. You're going to have a drawing section and a flattening section. To make the drawing section, I'm using a piece of one half by one and a half bar. And to make the flattening section, I'm just using uh, some pieces of leftover plate steel that I had from the original dies. So when you put these together, you'll have one section that you can flatten your billets and you'll have another section that you can draw them out quickly. Now you can see I have some pretty sharp angles here on the drawing section of these dies. After talking with some guys on the forms, I think I'll end up rounding over those corners to prevent any chances of putting deep gashes into my billets. So that's how the uh, drawing dies turned out. Next up here is I'm going to make a slag catcher for the back uh, just to cover the motor and the pump. So I'm just using some old angle iron here and drilling and tapping into the H frame. I got this tap holder idea from Houseworks, or at least he's the first guy I saw use one of these. And it really is pretty awesome. It allows you to put the tap into your drill and it greatly speeds up the process of tapping holes. So I'm just tapping some quarter 20 holes here to hold these brackets onto the back of the press. And I decided to go with bolting them onto the press instead of welding them just because I didn't know if I'd want to move them in the future or how well this system would really work. I'm using a 13 by nine by two inch deep baking pan here uh, to catch the slag. I'm also thinking about putting one of these on the front of the press later on, but we'll see how big of a problem that is uh, after I start using this guy. So here's a switch that I ordered online. It's a 30 amp switch, uh, which should be more than enough for this three horsepower motor. And I think it would actually be enough for a five horsepower motor if I ordered one of those in the future. Uh, the one negative about this switch is everything's really tight inside of this switch box. And I'm using a 10 gauge wire here. So it was just kind of hard to get this guy wired up. This is the old plug that I had, the old 220 plug. So I decided to reuse this guy. So I just cleaned up all of the contacts here. Uh, they had a little bit of rust on them. 
and then I rewired uh, this plug onto the end of my extension cord coming off the side of the press. Like I said, this is all uh, American wire gauge 10. So once I get this guy uh, wired up, I decided to test it out. But before I can test it out, I need a plug for 220. My new shop did not have a 220 outlet. So using some American wire gauge number eight cable, I wired in a new 50 amp 220 plug here on a 50 amp breaker. Just a side note here, I am not an electrician. So if you copy what I'm doing here and get electrocuted, it's not on me. But this seemed to work pretty good. I got 242 volts uh, coming out of this plug here. Obviously, I did it upside down there. I ended up going back and flipping that. So this is actually the first time I tested this three horsepower motor after it's been sitting up so long. And I was happy to see that it turned on and I don't have to buy a new motor. So that was definitely a win. So you can see how tight it is in that box there. I think if I had to redo it, I'd probably get a different switch. Maybe just like a large uh, switch box with an industrial like light switch. But uh, this got the job done, so I can't complain too much. So you can see here a little cable management. I put a cable holder so that no real weight was being pulled down on the switch box. And then I threw a hook on there so I can uh, store the cable when it's not in use. This is the new 10 gallon hydraulic reservoir that I bought from Northern. I went with the Northern Reservoir because it had the appropriate uh, inlet and outlet port sizes for uh, you know basically the stuff I already had and also like the large rate strainers and things of that nature. So uh, I found that their tank was also thicker in the wall thickness than most of the other tanks I saw online. So I just went with the more robust option here. I also like that this tank had a temperature and height gauge for how much fluid you had in the tank. So that's kind of a handy little option. I'm using the same control valve that I had in the original build. Now, these are very popular. You can find them all over the internet. I think they're made by Prince Hydraulics. Uh, they're a pretty cool valve and you can actually put a limiter on how much pressure you want this thing to operate at. It's on the front of the valve and there's an Allen key and you can adjust how much pressure you want this thing to kind of govern at. I had it set to around 1500 PSI, but towards the end here, I don't show it, but I brought it up to around 2700 PSI for the final uh, you know, pressure that I want this thing to stop at. I know my cylinder can go to 3000, but I kind of wanted to give a little safety factor there. So y'all can see me assembling this whole deal. You know, I got most of these parts off of Amazon, but I also got some from Northern. Uh, so if one or the other don't have the parts in stock, uh, you can go get them locally or, or off the internet. Like for instance, this filter I found at the Northern store and I wasn't able to find it online easily. I'm going to be using thread sealer on all this stuff uh, instead of using the tape. A lot of guys recommend not using a tape because they don't want tape to get inside of the hydraulic system. Uh, so I decided to just use this uh, thread sealer instead. So you can see most of the fittings I'm using have a swivel on them. And this allows me to use off the shelf hoses uh, without having to change out the fittings. So I only have to buy the fittings once and then I can replace the hoses fairly quickly. Once again, you know, if, if y'all are wondering about any of these specific components, I'm going to put a parts list in the description below just so that you can go find uh, pretty much anything you want to that I used in this video. I feel like that would be helpful if I was watching someone else's video. Side note, a lot of those links are affiliate links, so the channel will get a kickback if you use them. So this is the gauge I'm upgrading to. I had a kind of, I think I had a 2,500 PSI gauge. So I went to a 5,000 just because A, the cylinder is rated for 3,000. And one of these days I may buy a more powerful pump. The 11 gallon per minute pump that I'm using was rated for around 2,600 PSI, I think. Now, I think that's kind of odd because I'm definitely getting a higher pressure out of that pump. Uh, I think I set the limiter around 2750. So this pump seems to be capable of a little bit higher pressure uh, than what it said it's capable for. So here you see, I'm, I'm just putting this pump onto the mounting bracket and then we're gonna reinstall the Lovejoy coupling and the new spider. Get everything mated up nicely and bolted down. 
So in my plans that I put down below, like the, the dimensions for the actual frame itself, I put a really rudimentary diagram down there that I made in PowerPoint that kind of shows the flow path of the hydraulic fluid. Now, I know that's really basic for a lot of you guys, but for those of you who are just looking at hydraulics for the first time, it could be a little daunting. So this section here is the suction end. So I'm putting a 45 degree coupling here, which as you'll see in a second, I end up changing out because uh, it pokes the suction hose out at a weird angle from the press. And the reason I tried using that 45 degree uh, fitting is because that's a fitting that I had from the original build. But I decided to go back and buy an $11 fitting to make this look prettier just because it was driving me crazy. Probably would have been a tripping hazard too. So I put a 90 degree fitting there and cut the suction hose a little shorter so that it went straight up into the pump. This is the new cylinder. I actually bought this directly from Northern. They had the best price for a cylinder with these specs. The cylinder is rated for 3000 PSI, like I mentioned before. They also have in there that they have a 6,000 pound like burst pressure rating or something. So that's good to know. The old head method. Yeah, I was cracking myself up there with how I got that pin put into the clevis at the top of this thing. It was a little precarious, but I'm like, oh, I don't need a third hand. I'll just use my head. So got that done. Now this traveling block is pretty tight in the H frame. So I decided to go ahead and hook the cylinder up and move the cylinder clevis down to the traveling block instead of trying to force that traveling block up. One thing I did not know or notice or think of was that there is some trapped pressure inside of these cylinders, probably, I don't know, maybe during shipping or manufacturing. So when I undid the bottom Allen head plug there, it actually kind of busted open and sent hydraulic fluid all over the place. So just know that when you get a brand new cylinder, you may have some trap pressure in there. I'm happy I was standing off to the side. It didn't come out too fast or anything, but just out of a safety precaution, uh, make sure you always stand off to the side when you're undoing things that could have pressure behind them. These lines that we were hooking up to the top of the control valve are one half of an inch, 3,500 PSI lines. One of them is 24 inches and the other one is 36 inches. The line coming off of the back of the control valve goes to the bottom of the cylinder and the line coming off of the top of the control valve goes to the top of the cylinder. So here I'm pouring some hydraulic fluid into our 10 gallon tank. I'm just using some universal tractor fluid here. I originally thought that 10 gallons wouldn't fit into this tank, but uh, these fit perfectly and it filled up to the full line. So yeah, after we got this thing filled up, I decided to move it across my shop. So basically what I just said was after I got this thing significantly heavier with the fluid, I decided to move it across the shop. So I just slid it across the concrete here uh, all the way up to the outlet so I can turn it on. So this is the first time we're plugging it in here. Uh, I'm always a little cautious when I turn things on for the first time. So I, I use the dowel there to make sure nothing exploded. And I was a little nervous to pull the lever too. So I think there was a little bit of air in there. So it kind of popped a little on me or jolted down. So that kind of made me a little cautious, but I think that air worked its way out and it started working nice and smooth. So I was pretty happy at this point. It means that we didn't mess anything up. So I get the traveling block in there and I slowly move the cylinder down so that the clevis lines up with the holes in my traveling block and I just slide the pin in. Nothing to it. So once I have the pin installed, I can put the traveling block guides onto the front and the back of the press. These are using 7 16 hardware. And I tighten them up really tight. I found that, you know, I don't want any slop in this thing front to back or side to side. So uh, I'm going to wear some paint here and there, but that's obviously not a big deal. After we get these guides nice and tight, there's only one thing left to do to really top off this build. And that is to add a sticker. So I took off the safety sticker because who needs that? And added a red beard op sticker right onto the front of the cylinder. Just so everyone knows whose press this is. And this is the first test run up and down. It's working. I'm happy. Uh, there was a little leak at the top of the cylinder in that plug to the right you see there. I guess they didn't put that plug on there very tight from the factory. 
So I just went and tightened that plug up and no leaks after that. I put a little Waze oil on the press from my lathe uh, just to have a little bit of lubrication for a traveling block. Of course, here are some fun test presses. Uh, you'll be surprised at the stuff that I destroyed in my shop. I won't tell you all of it, but it's nice having a bunch of power here because you're just crushing things physically and metaphorically. So like I mentioned earlier, we, we put some stops in the front of our die holders. And this is just so that the dies won't come out when you're drawing out a billet. If you're pulling the billet towards yourself, you don't want to catch the die and shoot the dies out towards you. And then if for any reason there's any type of a non-square pressing on a billet, you don't want it to shoot the dies out in your direction. So after I crushed a golf ball here, I decided to do a more applicable test to what I'll be using this press for. So I took a piece of half inch steel here and just decided to start messing around with it on the combo dies. So you can see I was able to draw this steel out fairly quickly and then get it nice and flat in a pretty short period of time. So I was really happy to see the performance of this press with this little test here. I'm going to be making a bunch of Damascus with this press hopefully, so uh, stay tuned if that's what you all want to see. Well guys, like I said many times throughout this video, if you're looking for the parts list and the diagrams for this press, they are in the description down below. If you liked this video, please hit that like button down below as well and consider subscribing to the channel. Until the next time, I'll catch y'all on the flip side.